attention, start seeing me, sir. Mm. Maybe give it another five minutes or so. Okay. Oh. Oh, I think we're streaming live on YouTube now. Um, so, if you don't want to be recorded online, um, make sure to keep your camera off and yourself muted, and you shouldn't be recorded at all. And um, I'll remind everyone of this. When it's live. Well, shall we kick off, you think? Yeah, um, I think. Let's start. So, thanks everyone for coming today. This is our last day of the forum. Um, so the last two days we talked about how, like, what are the sustainability challenges of the coming decade. Yesterday we talked about how can individuals encourage the change and lasting change around environmental policy and sustainability. And today we're going to focus on the role of academia in like the green transformation. Um, a few housekeeping things. Um, could everyone keep their videos off and muted to like make sure the sound doesn't go funny? And if you have a question, use the chat or raise your hand. Um, because it's videoed and recorded on YouTube, as I, I think I mentioned this before, but um, if you don't want to be recorded, don't um, put your camera on or uh, your microphone on. Um, and yeah, that's it. So I'd like to thank um, our key speakers today. So um, today we have Dr. Mark Bergman, who is the director of the Centre of Environmental Policy at Imperial College London. 
and he's also the editor in chief of the journal Conservation, uh, of the journal called Conservation Biology. Um, so he's worked as like a consultant research scientist for Australia and the United States and Switzerland um, before joining the University of Melbourne. Um, and at Imperial College London now for I think two, uh, three years. Um, has published over 250 papers and authored several books. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited to hear what you have to say today. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tavia. That's, 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 thank you for the introduction. I'll share my screen straight away. I don't think I'll be able to see you once I do, so please just let me know if anything goes wrong. And uh, I'll take it from here, just a moment. Um, the big green button. Let me know when you can see. Can you see it yet? Okay. All right. Very good. Thanks. So uh, I'm going to talk about how academics can contribute to green transformation. I'm not going to talk about the obvious things. We, we, we can discover stuff. Um, we, can, we can build um, the architecture for new vaccines, for example. Um, we can design new kinds of engines. We can design new kinds of uh, power collection and distribution systems. That's, that's the stock in trade of fundamental science. The, the thing I want to talk about today is how to translate that into things that governments will use to make a difference to uh, something like green transformation. I'm particularly going to focus on government because that's where policy is set and that's where the ideas from academic, academic institutions are translated into, into activities, rules, regulations, um, protocols, incentives by government to change the way in which in which um, communities behave. So I'm going to do that by telling you a story, a story about how um, we approached a particular issue and the 10 years or so of activities that led to a uh, contribution to um, a, a circumstance that is much like the green transformation. So here's a survey of government we did about oh, 12, 15 years ago. Uh, governments uh, in, in several countries and the most frequently cited issues around the environment of course were things like climate change and persistence and increasing signals of climate change and notice number two in Australia more frequent and severe floods and fires and of course that has come to pass in the last year when the earlier this year when the fires were so prevalent and so devastating other things that have occurred to civil servants to be concerned about were things like threatened species, environmental priorities, water for urban environments. And I'm going to concentrate on numbers six and seven, new and damaging invasive species and marine pests. Now, COVID-19 is a new and damaging invasive species. And indeed, biosecurity deals with pests, diseases and pathogens, although it concentrates primarily, biosecurity primarily deal, deals with things that are not about human health, they're about damage to the environment or generally damage to uh, um, uh, social systems and damage to the economy and so on. Although there's, of course, clear crossovers between things like um, BSC and mad cow disease and other things that are diseases of both humans and animals. So our particular focus was on biosecurity. Now, there are we had applied for and won a grant to set up a centre devoted to biosecurity, in particular risk analysis around biosecurity. So the technology, the science of risk analysis applied to the particulars of managing invasive pests, diseases and pathogens of various kinds. There are conventional models for engaging in the development of policy with government. It can also be with private enterprise because private companies, large corporations have policy regimes that are very much like government regimes. There are policy briefs, science policy forums of various kinds, training courses and exchange programs, job shadowing. Now, some of you may indeed have already been involved in things like this. There are knowledge brokers, individuals who act as intermediaries between government and academics, various kinds of ad hoc informal working groups. 
And then, of course, there's the, the national funding schemes, uh, the, the various research councils, the UKRI, um, the, the National Science uh, Foundation in the United States, the Australian Research Council in Australia, other organisations that provide money to universities, to academics, to do research. And typically, governments are interested in both fundamental research, discovering new, new things that may or may not be valuable, and in the, in the development of things that can solve problems, in the things that can, uh, they can use to, to make a difference. The final thing in this list is a thing called a shared governance model. And I'm gonna to come to that at the end because it's something that arose out of our work and our relationship with government and are trying to affect um, policy that transcended the ordinary roots and that led to enhanced environmental outcomes. So internationally, biosecurity is, is a, a function of trade and the movement of people. And the World Trade Organization is underpinned by three standard setting bodies, regulatory bodies, who are responsible for pests, diseases and pathogens, the IPPC, um, that uh, focuses particularly on plants, the OIE, which focuses particularly on animals, and Codex, which fo focuses particularly on food for humans. Those are the three, th the three broad sets of agreements and, and organizations that govern how trade can operate with regard to plant pests, animal pests, and food standards. In, in exercising these protocols, there is a chance that the trade and the movement of people, the movement of goods and foods and so on, necessary for society and its function and for feeding the world, if you like, you can also um, transport problems, pests, diseases, pathogens, and there is no such thing as zero risk. So the idea behind these principles is that one provides a level of protection and reduce risk to an acceptable level. A very low level, typically it's called, but it typically means an acceptable level, not to zero. And it needs to account for the environment, for society and the economy. And the assessments that are made in reaching a decision about whether a particular commodity can be traded or a particular thing can move between one place and another, the assessments must be transparent, science-based and least trade restrictive. That is, the, the World Trade Organization is keen on enhancing the ability of countries to trade for the net benefit of everybody. So, the way in which this is done is that organizations, countries make an assessment, some sort of standard risk analysis in which they, they examine the likelihood of the event and the consequences of that event if it were to occur. And the likelihood is established by evaluating the probability that something associated with a commodity or a pathway will enter and establish and then spread. And if it spreads, the job is to estimate the consequences. And then the job is to say, well, what can we do to control or to live with or to mitigate those risks so that they are acceptable, so that they become very low? Most of those analyses are qualitative. Um, there is various, various kinds of evidence connecting pests and diseases and hosts and, and, and to environments of various kinds. It's, it involves plant and animal pathologists and veterinary scientists and um, uh, mathematicians, statisticians, all kinds of people are involved in this business. Now that's a very broad thumbnail introduction to something that you probably don't want to know much about. The idea, however, of that introduction is to, is to give you a sense of the context in which this thing evolved because this is a model for the involvement of academics in transformations that have environmental value. Initially, in back in, way back in 2006, we set up a governance arrangement for the relationship between the academics and the policymakers that was, that was typical of research funded by federal uh, national governments given to universities to do something that governments were concerned about. It was a centre, centre of excellence. And there are many such centres in the UK, around the world. And the, tip, the governance model was that projects were outlined by university and government staff and developed into proposals by university staff. They were reviewed by a panel, um, by a scientific advisory panel. They were approved by a government secretariat. And then they were implemented. The university staff went away and did the work. 
Um, usually, um, the, the, the projects were developed in consultation with government, but were typically the ideas of university staff. There was oversight by a university advisory panel and a board of made up of university and government members. This is a very standard operating model. And the centre was called the Australian Centre of Excellence for Risk Analysis, uh, based at the University of Melbourne. Now, it was, uh, it precipitated a culture clash. We arrived in government with a budget and with access to a bunch of people. And, um, and we said, so what problems can we solve for you? We're here to help. And they looked at us and said, you don't know anything about biosecurity. Well, you, there, are, there, were, there were veterinary scientists and plant pathologists in our set, but nevertheless, we did not work in government. And within government, there was divisions dealing with plants and animals and food and other things. And, there were, and they were suspicious of one another within departments. In government, if you pay for a product, if there's a report and you have paid for it, you expect it to be delivered. In a university, if you recruit a PhD student, not all student, not all PhD students complete. <laughs> I know I don't want to frighten anyone in this in this in this audience, but not all PH, PhDs are completed, and not all reports are completed. Now, there was there are other cultural differences in universities. We share very rough drafts with our colleagues. In, in government, that seemed to be unprofessional. A, a, a draft document is something that looks as though it's ready to go out the door. It is something that is complete. The language is polished, the formatting is done. Sci uh, university scientists will share stuff on the back of an envelope, and that's not done in government. There are behavioral norms about how we dressed, um, how we communicated in emails, um, who we communicated with, and and, and, and as, as I learned, um, civil servants form networks of trusted colleagues and they share information. And sharing information is like breathing. Information is like oxygen to, uh, to a civil servant. And one shares information with trusted colleagues. There were various things about technical skills and staff turnover. Univers people in universities tend to stay in the same role much longer than people in, in government and so on. And as a consequence of this culture clash, we developed a set of tools. Uh, and my screen is not moving, and I don't know why. There we go. That were successful academically and unsuccessful in government. Now, the, the primary example I use of this is this thing called a species distribution model. It's a way of developing a mathematical mo model between that, that relates the distribution of an organism with its physical and biological environment. And it allows one to predict where something is going to turn up. Um, it, it allows one to um, uh, make very reasoned and very defensible assessments of the, the extent of an invasive species, for example. This particular map is a model of the potential spread of dengue fever in Australia under climate change. And it's a, it's a disease that Australia currently doesn't have, but will have in the next 50 years, and, and we need to be prepared. And these models are robust, they're well-developed, they're mathematically sophisticated, and they were completely ignored by government. Now, Jane Ehrlich, the senior author of this body of work, is one of the world's most highly cited environmental scientists, and yet her work was not adopted by government because it was too complicated. It, was, it did more than they needed to do been picked up for some special cases and it does some of course it, it, it works um, and it's getting better and better as time goes along but it uh, it is it was not at the time adopted by the federal government another example was this uh, the development of new tools for multi-criteria decision analysis you have a number of options you have a number of criteria how do you decide what to do when faced with a multi criteria problem and there have there were and there still are evolving techniques that are a, a mixture of of, of, of um, economic theory social economic theory uh, psychology and behavioral science that that provide a platform for people to interact and to identify solutions that are satisfactory and a, a general solution that people can tolerate and that is robust to social change it's a, it's, a, it's a really interesting way of doing things and 
it was not adopted either because it did not solve a particular problem that at that time the government felt it had, at least this government department felt that it had. Um, in contrast, rather than use the, the sophisticated mathematical models that our colleague Jane Elith was developing, the, 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 the government at the time developed a, 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 an architecture for um, predicting the distributions of plants and animals that was much, much simpler, that used no mathematics at all, virtually no mathematics at all, and uh, could be implemented and understood by almost anyone with very little training. And this is what was adopted at that time in this department. Now, this is, this is, this, the tool was in itself very useful. It just didn't use all of the theory, the ecological theory, the mathematical theory that one could have used to come up with a more precise estimate. But that precision was unnecessary to the class of problems that, that at that time confronted the government. So after about three years of this, we produced a whole suite of reports. And these reports, uh, we, we handed to government and they politely accepted them and said, this looks lovely and put them on a shelf and ignored them. And so after, a couple, after three years, we sat with our colleagues in government and said, is this working? Is this working for you? Because we're not sure it's working for us. We want to make a difference. We want, we want to influence what you do with good science and we're doing what we think is good science and it doesn't seem to be hitting the mark. What's wrong? How can we make this better? And they said, well, we agree. We're getting what we expected from an academic institution, a bunch of reports, some of which we might be able to use. Um, and we may be able to use some of them to some extent. So we decided to change things. We decided to move on and let government, science and policy staff identify the problems. Note the word university does not appear in that first sentence. This was a big step for us. We said, OK, you define the problems. You define what needs doing and we'll do our best to try and do something about it. Now, those were approved by a government steering committee and the full proposals were then formulated and developed by government and university staff, by both of them. That took you know, a little time to get used to because we had to work closely with our science colleagues in government to develop a research proposal. Those proposals were assessed by a board. There was an additional step beyond government to identifying the problems. It was that they would then be jointly responsible for delivery so that if, for example, a PhD student or a postdoc was involved and they didn't deliver because they wouldn't got another job or they didn't want to complete their thesis or whatever, then the government person was responsible for delivering the report. It was, it, was a, it was a joint responsibility. Um, there was independent oversight by a science advisory committee and a government tech, technical committee, but there were a couple of very significant changes. And some of the university staff said, actually, I don't want to do this. This is not for me. I want to do the stuff that I want to do. And if it's useful, fine, you can use it, but I don't want to be asked to do something. But fully two thirds of the people who were involved in the original centre said, Actually, this sounds pretty interesting. It's a challenge. It means that I have to look at these problems and see if I can help, see what I can bring to the solution. And it led to what we then, what, what, were, what were useful outcomes that were both academically interesting and regulatory, in a, and useful in a regulatory environment. One of the first questions they asked us in this new environment was, so. How do we know we've got the best possible expert? I was, well, <laughs> that's not something we're working on, but okay, we go and ask someone. We, we went to ask people. We asked friends in epistemology, sociology, so, psychology, social science. And they said, well, I don't know. There's some theories about who's an expert and what defines expertise and what a domain of expertise is, but how do you know if you've got the best expert? Well, I don't know. So we had to start working on this. And it was not a question that we had thought to ask ourselves. We started working on this in 2007 and we're still working on it. It led to some, some very significant research projects funded by the US government and the Australian government and a whole world of papers and books on expertise, expert judgment, and how, and most importantly, how to improve the quality of expert judgments. And it led us down research pathways we would never have gone under our own steam. Um, 
we started to work on inspection systems. And um, in those inspection systems, we had to learn, and it took about a year to work this out, that the inspection systems have to intercept as much as possible. They have to learn as much as possible about changes in materials associated with particular pathways. And they need to deter people from sending materials that are contaminated. And to do all three things require very different strategies. And those strategies are then embodied on in who looks for what, when, and what kind of training they have, and how long they look for, and what materials and tools they use for looking, and, and so on. And we started a, a mining data to determine who we should look for and who we should not look for. And for example, in this particular um, graph, there is a, 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 an estimate of the probability that a person arriving on an aeroplane will be carrying quarantine risk material. And the second one from the bottom, the one with that, that, that is very, very unlikely, that, so this is, this, is, um, this is in fact how unlikely they are, how the people who are very unlikely to be carrying risk material, people from New Zealand. If an aeroplane comes from New Zealand, it's almost not worth looking in their baggage because they take quarantine very seriously in their own country. When they travel, they do it very seriously elsewhere. And we got involved in things like um, foresight and, and developing social media and developing software. So we wrote a bit of software that was pro that is probably crawling around your phone as we speak looking for, for keywords associated with biosecurity risk materials, not because we want to know whether you're carrying something, but because we want to know about emerging problems as soon as they happen. And we have some lovely examples of, of, of emerging problems that we discovered early enough to be able to intervene and circumvent a very significant problem simply by discovering it early enough. So these are places where we did not know that we would be and We've had a lot of fun working in them. So the general, the general advice for people who want to make a difference, if you're in an academic institution and you want to make a difference to uh, government policy or indeed private enterprise policy that wants to move in the direction of, um, of, uh, of, of policy that is, has, has improved environmental outcomes, you need to take into account a range of things that you may not have contemplated having to deal with. It's how you speak. It's how you communicate. It's um, if you're going to work with government, it is a really good idea to find a mentor, someone in government who thinks what you have to offer is valuable and will help you navigate government to have to so that it finds the right place. You need to cooperate. You need to listen. You need to try and develop an, a context in which there is joint responsibility for the delivery of things that can help government. You need to work for a long time with your government colleagues so that they learn to trust you. You need to have the right people in, in the academic institution, people who want to do this work. You need to have the right governance system so that you can work effectively together. And it really helps to insist on the appeals to consistency and logic in the solutions that you provide that are so valuable to government when they need to defend a new policy or a new direction. So you need to take the time to listen, you need to address the problems for which the policymaker actually needs a solution, and you need to find solutions that they can use. And that is just a matter of listening and iteration and patience. And it's not for everybody, but if that's your goal, you need to do those things. And finally, there are some things that policymakers need to know about us, about the academics. And this is a little paper that uh, Bill Sutherland at, at Cambridge and I wrote a few years back. Um, tips for interpreting scientific claims. The things that we can't expect policymakers and regulators to, but not all of them can be scientists and many of them are not. There are all kinds of people, there are lawyers and economists and all kinds of people. They need to understand of us that we are imperfect, we're very, very imperfect. They need to understand that our data are incomplete, that we often extrapolate, and when we do so, we, we, we can be a little incautious. They need to check that we have used controls and have randomized when we can. They need to be aware that we are particularly susceptible to faulty interpretations of significance tests, it's a common problem, um, and that we often misunderstand our own statistical tests. We, they need to be sure that we haven't dredged or cherry-picked the data. They need to ask what I haven't been told. 
they need to be aware of the fact that we may be unaware of confounding, of hidden dependencies, of uh, potential for surprise. Often our models, our data, our assessments, our, our inferences are at least in part determined by expert judgment and then need to ask how that expert judgment was acquired. There are good and bad ways of getting expert judgments. They need to be aware of motivational biases, psychological frailties and groupthink in our deliberations and that we're sometimes susceptible to those things and maybe unaware of our susceptibilities. And finally, they need to be aware that our status, the fact that we're a big shot, for example, in our domain, is a poor guide to our performance on tasks of prediction and judgment and that there are much better ways of doing it than to ask the best regarded person in the room. That's as much as I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll, end, I'll stop sharing my screen so you don't have to look at my emails. Thank you so much. Go. Um, so if anyone has any questions, feel free to get them in the chat or just ask them. Um, whilst we're waiting, I think I have a question. Um, so you mentioned how there's like there can be in certain situations mistrust between the academic and the policy maker. And I'm wondering in those situations where this like mistrust, mistrust stems from and how can you tackle this issue? Uh, I, tell you, I think I understood that. You sounded a little as though you were speaking underwater, but I think I, I, think I heard it. <laughs> um, where does the mistrust stem from? And uh, and I, I, I think it's not a popular thing to say, but I think in large part the distrust stems from the fact that scientists particularly are often arrogant. We, we believe we know the right answer and we go in there and we just want to tell them and we don't spend enough time listening to precisely what their problem is. We're also very ready to criticise uh, operational procedures that look to us externally and without context to be oversimplified or uh, making too many assumptions or too hasty and we and in doing so we don't understand the regulatory environment nor the political environment in which our colleagues operate and it's that understanding that allows us to generate useful solutions when we are when we are confronted with those circumstances so often i think the fault is ours rather than theirs that they that they should reasonably distrust us because we don't listen well enough to them Someone, I, I mean, I'm only in my third year, so I haven't even gone into like the field. Oh. <laughs> but it's really interesting to hear. We have another question in the chat um, from Jesse. Uh, so, can you comment on the dangers of working on science in quotes that they can use versus science as like an interesting and important kind of thing to the Um. I actually don't think that there are significant dangers in particular associated with working on science that is useful. Um, like anything, it can, uh, a scientific solution can be abused, um, misused, um, either, either through, through um, ignorance or through, um, through deliberate misuse. But that, they're always possible. We, can't, we cannot protect against those things. Um, the, the advantage of trying to develop something that is useful in a particular regulatory or, or a policy context is that if you have discussed and understand the policy makers problem and you find something that they can use, typically it will be better than the thing that they have or they wouldn't, have, they wouldn't adopt it and they wouldn't want it in the first place. And you introduce a degree of improvement in that regulatory process that otherwise they wouldn't have. So I, I only see an upside to using, to, to useful science. Um, the, the science that's interesting or important uh, is, is, I would discriminate, I would call it fundamental science. And, and our colleagues in government are interested, but then they have to take the step of translating that fundamental advance into something that they can use. And I do think that that's better done as a collaborative ent enterprise between the scientist and the regulator than by either one in isolation. 
the, the, the scientist in, in government or the, the policy person in government is going to struggle to understand the details and the nuances of the new scientific discovery. And the scientist in isolation is going to struggle to understand the nuances and the constraints of the regulatory environment. They really have to sit together. They have to do this in partnership. Oh, you're muted now, Octavia. You're both underwater and muted. <laughs> Another question um, from John. So, can you can you hear me okay? Am I too quiet still? Yes, I, I can see the chat now. So, political polarization of this issue seems quite rampant here in the US. Yeah, absolutely. Do you see partisanship having having to play in addressing or mitigating climate change? This is such an interesting question. I don't know the answer. Uh, it, this is new, and I think this is going to be not entirely, but largely, a problem of your generation, and I'm really glad it's yours and not mine because it looks really difficult. The, the emergence of social media, the different kinds of social media, the polarization and petitioning of knowledge within those social media, the social bubbles that are sometimes constructed purposefully and other times constructed just because people gravitate to opinions that, 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 that they accord with. All of those things are deeply interesting, will affect the way in which society uses science in the next 20 or 30 years and are only just now being begun to being studied. So the extent to which partisanship affects the use of science is an open question and I think it's really deeply interesting. Um, I hope one of you works on it and, uh, and makes sense of it and figures out a way of getting what we would see to be uh, the facts of the matter into the public domain in a way that can be interpreted by whomever your, 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 your political persuasion might be. Yes, shall I read it out? <laughs> to what extent does the political leaning of those in government affect the way in which young scientists interact with politicians to adopt scientific insights? in terms of appealing to their interests and motives. That's interesting. I had worried about this too before I got into this. There's, there, there, are, there are actually three types of humans in this set. Um, there are scientists, there are policy makers or civil servants, and then there are politicians. And I, I think our place is to work with the civil servants, not necessarily with the politicians. The, I, 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 I get that because, because um, the Politics is, is a complex and dynamic and diverse and, to me, impenetrable business. Um, and the, but the, the goal is clear. You want, you want to re retain your seat in parliament. That, that, that's, that's every politician's self-interest. Civil servants, because they have a permanent job, almost every civil servant I've ever met is uh, dedicated to maximising net social benefit. And that's a fine thing to devote your life to. And as a consequence, I think that scientists and civil servants, despite the differences of their environment, have a great deal in common in terms of their interest in having science adopted. And, and that's why I think they're the right people for us to work with. So they, and they can shield us from politicians and their political leanings. Thank you very much. I'll just have one more question. Um, <laughs> I'll just speak a bit to Ellen. <laughs> okay, so, uh, how do you expect science to inform citizens' decisions to support or not policy proposals? How do you expect science to inform citizens' decisions? That's a great question. I, uh, I and and perfectly honest, I don't know the answer. Um, there, there are lots of mechanisms for doing this. I don't know how effective they are. The, the, I guess this is more the domain of we're starting to stray with this question, which is a great question, into the domain of. Um, of social science and 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 uh, epistemology, even how how is knowledge translated into into citizens' decisions? Um, I wish I knew more. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's a terrible answer, but I just don't know. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Um, I think. I think um, we're done. Are we? I think. <laughs> Oh, you're very welcome. Thanks yeah. very much for inviting me. Um, we have um, Dr. Anna Cookie here um, with the next presentation. Um, so. I'll, 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 I'll mute. Sorry? Oh. 
I'll, I'll just bat out now and and uh, <laughs> and mute and things. Thanks, everybody. Okay, sorry. Let me just. My computer's a bit of a mess right now. So, hi. Um, the next speaker we have, Dr. Ellen Quigley. She is <clears throat> um, part of my college, Jesus College, um, Cambridge. Um, she's a research associate in climate risk and sustainable finance at the Cambridge Centre for the Study of Existential Risk. She's also the um, advisor to the chief financial officer at the University of Cambridge and um, as part of this authored a report on divestment on the advantages and disadvantages of it for the university and her research interests are sort of span the very wide however um, in terms of sustainability you know how can we um, mitigate climate change and inequality through investment policies and practices of institutional investors um, so I think you can share your screen. I hope the you can. Um, I'm not. I'm not a user of slides. If oh, that's okay. Amazing. Don't yeah. worry. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. I'll I'll be quiet now. Well, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm I'm really pleased to be speaking with you all today. Um, in terms of uh, policy, I think a lot about how to create um, a kind of a conducive policy um, environment, um, which is by um, helping to think of ways of engaging with um, other parties that have similar interests to governments. Um, so I look a lot at uh, systemic risks, which is also the focus of a lot of the research that happens for the, at the uh, Center for the Study of Existential Risk. And we end up looking at problems that really can't be solved by one actor or even one country. Um, they're things that require collective action to really prevent. Um, and a lot of these, well, all of these risks are likely less problematic and expensive to deal with um, at the outset rather than trying to pick up the pieces afterwards. And unfortunately, just to give the example of uh, COVID, uh, we were, there were reports uh, put out as, as late as November 2019 saying that we could spend as little as $1.4 billion a year to prevent a pandemic like the one we've seen. Um, instead of doing that, which we didn't do despite the warnings, um, we've now spent you know, in the trillions to try to address the problem after the fact. So if you look at um, you know, who, who, who cares about these systemic risks, who can help solve them, who's able to um, work collectively with other bodies that have the same um, concerns, um, you end up with um, two key uh, responses, which is um, one is government obviously, and the kind of international bodies that support uh, government. And on the other hand, you have um, institutional investors like pension funds and so on and so forth. And I'll kind of explain why that is the case. Um, so uh, if you look at uh, a large pension fund or a sovereign wealth fund, um, they their investments cross borders in much the same way as a lot of these um, systemic risks do. So, um, you know, climate change is the perfect example, but um, COVID also applies. Um, and these, these investors basically own a representative slice of the entire economy. And therefore they're exposed to the risks associated with uh, so-called externalities that occur when you know, a sector or a company um, does something that adds costs to other companies um, or other parts of society without having to pay for them. Um, so for example, a very emissions intensive company um, will not necessarily pay for uh, the results of their uh, pollution. Instead, it'll get picked up elsewhere in the system. And if you look at what constrains uh, government action, um, you know, one of the things that really constrains government action, of course, is, uh, you know, political lobbying, pressure from uh, sectors or companies. Um, and what they need is support from institutions that have a lot of power and finance, like uh, institutional investors, uh, to kind of create a supportive environment for the kind of legislation that we need. Because um, otherwise they're more, much more likely to hear uh, from entities that um, would rather keep legislations loose. Um, and again, just to, to uh, confirm, uh, a lot of these issues simply can't be dealt with unless there are um, regulations in place, things like uh, you know, carbon tax or um, limits on the um, extraction and production and, and exploration for in the first place of, of fossil fuels, for example. So, um, you know, you really do need that kind of um, across the board entity that can um, put in place uh, supportive legislation. 
Um, but the other problem is that um, policymakers um, are often caught in a bit of a bind because they have to um, take into account the actions of other countries. Um, sometimes that can mean that they end up with positive pressures around um, treaty negotiations and the like, um, and that can actually ratchet up ambitions as we hope will happen in time for COP26 negotiations in, uh, in Glasgow uh, later next year. Um, but at other times, it actually makes it uh, more difficult because uh, you know if your if your neighboring uh, country has uh, lower taxes or or fewer regulatory uh, uh, strictures that companies have to adhere to, uh, then that can be actually a, a real disincentive to adopt um, things that you're likely to get blowback um, from companies um, for doing. So so this is why it actually makes a big difference if large um, institutional investors like pension funds or university endowments um, take their power as financiers and kind of apply some of these same rules across all companies. Because the part of the other issue is, of course, that the same kind of race to the bottom dynamic exists for companies too. So even, uh, you know, the uh, executives of a company who would actually rather um, decarbonize, um, they often feel like they can't do that because it would require some upfront investment that would put them at a disadvantage relative to their peers. Um, so that's a pretty fundamental problem, you'd think, um, except for that um, a, in, in, in some cases, a majority of uh, companies listed on the stock market, um, like many of the big names that we can think of, um, are actually majority owned by institutional investors like pension funds and the like. Um, and they actually have uh, powers that aren't typically used. Um, they can actually, um, you know, force uh, kind of uh, internal uh, rules that look a bit like the legislation that we might want um, nationally and internationally. Um, they can replace board members, they can change the governance of these, uh, these companies if they don't act in accordance with systemic risk reduction. Um, and then in turn, that creates an environment in which um, governments are less likely to get the kind of pressure from, uh, from companies to uh, you know, loosen environmental regulations, for example, um, or, or not bring, on, bring in limits on um, fossil fuel exploration um, and extraction. So, um, so that's, that's what I, I work on as a, as a researcher is to, to build out um, these ideas around um, systemic risk reduction. Um, so I, I do a lot of research on these institutional investors. Um, I, call, I call them universal owners um, because they own a bit of everything. Um, and they kind of care about the whole system and should care about uh, systemic risks um, and then try to kind of find ways to make it uh, more practically um, implementable from their standpoint. Um, there are other dynamics that make it harder or easier for these um, entities to be supportive of the kind of government action that we need to see through policy. Um, and it's, you, you could view it as a bit of a, of a, a, a ratcheting operation. Um, so, uh, in, in much the same way as there are kind of competitive pressures for whole companies, for the fund managers of some of these um, major institutional investors, uh, they, they don't want to, there's, there's a saying that I'm going to probably um, uh, misquote, but it, it's that, you know, it's okay to, to fail with everyone, um, uh, but not to, to be the only one to fail. So, so you, you see a lot of strange uh, risk aversion on the part of fund managers who don't want to um, step out of line, even if they're um, quite sure that, you know, their particular investment strategy um, will be successful, uh, because they don't want to be uh, the one that, that, that fails, even for, for a year, that can be kind of career destroying. Um, See, so what you have to do is, is come up with uh, a system in which you're, you're adopting common standards. Um, that means that um, you don't have to change um, what you own so much as how you own it and what you get those companies to actually change in their operations. Um, and then again, because all companies are facing the same pressures from their owners, um, then it, they're much less likely to, um, to oppose uh, the, the sort of supportive uh, policy that we would want to see um, on the part of national governments. Um, and also it reduces, as I said before, um, the, the pressure that governments will feel um, to try to kind of outcompete uh, other countries for um, you know, attractive, uh, business uh, legislation or the lack thereof. Um, so anyway, that's that's a lot of the work that I do, but I'm actually really curious to hear about um, 
your questions. Um, I might just, I, I see that um, that my, my colleague John has um, put in place, has uh, pasted into the chat, uh, my report on uh, fossil fuel divestment for the university. Uh, a, a lot of this actually fits into the same um, kind of um, intellectual framework because it gets into um, the, the different asset classes and the kind of impact that you have with those. And I'll maybe just leave you with one final thought that brings together that piece of work and the work on um, universal ownership. Um, it's, it's this idea that um, much of the investment industry, even the parts that deal with um, responsible investment or environmental, social and governance investing, ESG, whatever you want to call it, ethical investment, um, is really focused on protecting a portfolio from the risks like climate change, you know, physical climate risk and so on and so forth, as opposed to looking at the risk that the portfolio causes to the real world. So it's, it's looking at how do I protect my returns from uh, risks like climate and, uh, and COVID, as opposed to how might I be contributing to the risk of uh, catastrophic climate change or a runaway pandemic in the way that I invest and where I put my money. And, and as soon as you flip things around like that, um, you get a very different view. Um, of what you should do as a responsible inv uh, investor. And I think that's what's happening that's very interesting at, uh, at Cambridge is that um, a lot of the bursars and the um, central university is really thinking about how do we have an impact with our um, investments and how do we at the very least not contribute to these systemic risks. Um, and I think that's really powerful. Um, I mean, not, not just because it's, it really does help to reach into different areas um, of the financial system and kind of create some systemic change there. But again, that, that helps um, uh, be supportive of uh, government legislation, which is ultimately what, ultimately what we need to, to solve problems that are, that are so systemic. Um, so that's, that's why I'm really excited about this work and, um, and about its potential to, to help reduce some of these systemic risks in the real world. Um, so I've got a, should I just read through the questions, Octavia? Is that all right? Hello, I've used a different mic, so can you hear me? Yes, yeah, good. That's oh, okay, better, great. Yeah, better sound. Oh, great, I did try and change it. Um, no, thank you so much. Um, does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask um, and ask them on the chat? And maybe we can reframe some of the questions asked to Mark, and then like, it would be interesting to see your perspective on them as well. Um, um, well, I have a quite a like practical question from um, someone on YouTube. Um, from um, and so the question says, um, my department, for example, my, I mean my department's Earth Sciences, her department's Chemical Engineering. Um, we're purely funded by, well, maybe not purely, but quite largely funded by like fossil fuel companies, oil companies such as BP, uh, Shell. Um, what, what as researchers or people working in these departments, what should we do? Wow, that is a really good question, but also really difficult. And I feel like I'm at, at risk of stepping on people's toes in responding to it, to be honest. Um, I mean, I think that researchers are in a generally, ge like genuinely very difficult position um, because you're kind of reliant on that funding. And so are you know, the people that you work with and uh, the people that you work for. Um, I mean, I think the question comes down to how, how much do you think it's possible for the, the company that you're taking money from to actually transition in line with the Paris Agreement goal of well below 1.5 degrees? Um, thus far, uh, so I did perform this um, initial analysis as part of the divestment report. Um, the link is in the chat here. Um, that there, there is no fossil fuel company that is truly aligned with the Paris Agreement goal. Um, there are a couple that have made some changes that take them closer, certainly than any of them have come to, uh, come before. Um, aside from Orsted and a couple of other kind of smaller former fossil fuel companies that have actually completely made the switch, which is really interesting. But I think the answer is, you know, how do you think it's possible that the company that you that your um, center takes money from? Um, can actually make that switch? Um, and what might you be able to do to actually help contribute to that, if so? And if not, then I think there, you know, that there is this need to kind of speak up about that um, within the university and, and start a hard conversation. Um, but I don't think anyone has the perfect answer to this. I certainly don't, but it's a good question. 
We have a question from, I, I'm not sure if you can see the chat, but from Mark Bergman, our previous speaker. Um, is your broader view of investment risk adopted by, um, oh, what is your broader view of investment risk adopted by, say, Goldman Sachs? So uh, I would say, <laughs> I would say that Goldman Sachs and other investment uh, entities uh, think in exactly the opposite way um, to what, um, what I've been proposing here. Again, they're looking at the risks to their returns. So they're thinking, am I going to lose money um, for investing in you know, particular companies? And the way that you can tell is if they apply whatever screens or risk management to their public equity portfolio. So again, public equity is uh, the big companies that are listed on the stock market. Um, and if, if that's where you know, screens or risk analysis is being applied, you know that the, that the um, investment uh, firm in question is really much more worried about um, whether they're going to lose money because of those, these risks. They're not concerned about trying to reduce those risks. Whereas if, if those uh, firms are looking at their bond portfolio, at their relationship with banks um, and uh, private equity, so that's where new capital is coming from and going into fossil fuels. Um, again, it's, it is mostly debt, um, so bank lending and bonds. Um, if they're looking at those other asset classes and sources of actual new capital, then you know that actually they're concerned about how they're contributing to those risks in the real world. Um, I still see almost no one thinking that way. It's incredibly rare still. Although in the last few months, I have to say, I've never heard uh, so many kind of positive signs start to emerge. Um, not at Goldman Sachs that I know of, but um, some other, especially asset owners like pension funds are starting to think about it, which is really heartening. Um, question from YouTube. Is there maybe a third way of thinking about this investment versus harms, perhaps, instead of protecting my investment from risk or minimizing my contribution to some risk? Should we instead be investing more in things that address those risks in the first place? Yes, it, exactly. Um, so the way that you really truly address risk is you have to um, invest in things that reduce, like actively reduce the risk. Um, but you also do have to stop investing in the things that uh, that contribute to the risk. So we could build as many solar arrays as we wanted to, but if we continue to burn fossil fuels, then um, we can't get to net zero. You have to get down to zero emissions um, and you, you can't do that unless you, you stop uh, emitting. Um, we have another question here. Uh, what role does climate scenario analysis play in your research? Is it being employed to understand climate change impacts on the university endowment fund? So. I would say that the university endowment fund is thinking in both ways. They are looking at uh, the effect of climate change on the portfolio, but they are now actually looking at the impact of the portfolio um, on the real world, which is great. Um, I would say that climate scenario analysis, again, as it's usually used to determine how much your, your personal portfolio uh, will suffer because of climate change. Um, I have yet to see climate scenario analysis be used to, to determine the extent to which the portfolio is contributing to those risks. So again, this it's just this tremendous focus on, on, on how to make sure that you lose as little money as possible as opposed to how do we actually address this risk in the first place. Uh, we've got another question here. Um, could you comment on mechanisms to achieve a shift from hedging risk to uh, reducing damage? Um, great, yeah. So so. I outlined one, which is that which asset classes you look at. So um, one of the main mechanisms I think is to shift towards looking at debt and private equity and venture capital. Uh, so venture capital is early stage companies. You don't want those to grow if they are going to contribute hugely to the problem. You'd rather invest in things that will again, help solve the, the issue in the first place. Um, and then if you're worried about kind of the, the ongoing um, uh, uh, emissions from existing companies, then you're really looking at debt. So um, uh, evidence that I've seen suggests that around 64% um, of new capital for fossil fuels comes from bank lending. And most of that comes from two or three large global banks, um, which is insane, actually. Having such a small group of actors that are contributing so much to the new capital that's, that's still flowing to fossil fuels is really wild. Um, you're, you probably bank with them. Uh, Barclays is the, the largest um, financer of fossil fuels in Europe, for example, um, and by a long shot. Um, so so that's, I think that's the big mechanism is making sure that you're looking at those, those asset classes um, for an institutional investor, that's absolutely critical. Um, 
And then, okay, so you're asking not for you as an investor, but for systems in general. Um, well, this is the problem is that this is, this is where the new money is coming from. It's not coming from government. Um, government can bring in legislation that would um, shift some of these flows of capital, but um, they kind of need the supportive behavior of large investors like like pension funds and so on to, to do that um, as well. Otherwise, you, you just can't um, get at that that flow of, of new money. Um, but in, in general, uh, for, for systems in general, I mean, this is why I get nervous when people talk about um, adaptation as opposed to mitigation. I totally acknowledge and accept that some adaptation needs to happen. Um, but I worry that the adaptation will happen in places that are already wealthy and that that will actually reduce those countries' will to actually mitigate climate change uh, in the first place um, and therefore cause um, you know, more people from countries that had nothing to do with causing climate change um, to, to require more adaptation that they don't have the funds for. Um, so I guess that's the other uh, factor, I think, in terms of uh, policy is you know, making sure that the focus on adaptation doesn't end up reinforcing some of the inequalities that, we've, that we see in the kind of existing situation with, with climate change um, and that we really are um, putting everything we've got into uh, mitigation with the understanding that you know, there are already things happening in especially in other parts of the world that are having a tremendous effect on real people's lives and, um, and they do need funding for adaptation. But um, you know, we should probably be thinking more about mitigation than, uh, than adaptation in the UK because it's a wealthy country. Um, I've got a question just, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I, I, I had a question ju just to me privately. It says, uh, are large multinationals as opposed to institutional and, uh, and gov investors more likely to, um, to be adverse to certain ex existential risks than others? Uh, yeah, probably. So for example, one risk that I worry quite a bit about, um, I wouldn't call it, an egg, well, no, it, it could be an existential risk, oh God. Um, I worry about soil a fair bit um, because it's, it actually, um, if you think, if you think down that route too long, it becomes quite horrifying. But basically we've, we've heard that we have between 50 and 60 harvests left at the rate at which we're depleting soil. Um, but actually you can, I know, <laughs> it's crazy. Um, but actually you can, you can sequester carbon in the soil um, and thereby revitalize it and make it um, more productive as well as with, you know, greater nutrients for the food you grow and so on and so forth. So it's like we could continue down this path in which it's rather horrifying or, or we actually could um, suck up some excess carbon through, um, you know, soil management. Um, so I suspect that, for example, large multinationals in the agriculture space are, I mean, they should be. If they're not worrying about it, that's a problem. But they, they're probably worrying about uh, about soil, because that is an, kind of an existential risk to their business, if you will. Um, and of course, for all of us, if you think about what would happen if we couldn't grow crops to feed enough people, you would end up with mass forced migration and conflict and mass famine. I mean, it would be really, really bad. So that's uh, the sort of thing that we should all be worrying about. But I do suspect that the companies that are heavily concentrated in that sector would, would be worrying about it. Wow, that the fact about the harvest is quite shocking. Yeah, it's worse. <laughs> um, I have like a, a quite a, a very broad question actually for both you and Mark. Um, so Mark was sort of talking about how academics and policymakers how we should interact with each other, not just you know it, you know even to the extent of like how academics sort of exchange information in different ways than government officials do. Um, and I was wondering, you know, how can we navigate the relationship between academics, policymakers, and because they all play important roles. Um, but I don't think there's like, I'm not sure what, what's the best way of like bringing about all these changes and like things that you want to happen. Um, Mark, do you have any interest in covering that first? Because I actually feel like I'm not the best at doing that. Yes. Um, for me, it just has to do with bothering people, kind of, and hoping they'll listen, but that's maybe not a strategic answer. <laughs> oh, so great. Uh, thanks, thanks for your talk. I really, that was just fascinating. I, my daughter works for Goldman Sachs. That's why I asked the question. Huh? <laughs> no, no, she Sorry. is. She, she wants to get into their, um, to their, uh, their, their um, ethical investment branch. They have one. <laughs> okay, 
right. Well, I'm happy to talk to her about it. Uh, I will send her your way. She'll be delighted <laughs> to talk to you. She's she'll be over this way sometime. Anyway, look that that aside. Um, so the ideas that you have are, 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 are seem to me to be pragmatic, and and could be turned into a suite of tools that investors or bankers could use, um, or that governments could use to design policies that would encourage bankers to work or investors to work in particular ways. But to do that, you'd have to get in close with these policy makers, which would mean that you personally would have to spend in the vicinity of five years getting to know and getting the trust of the right policymakers who would talk to the right politicians. I mean, that, that, that's the investment it would require. Do you have that in you to do? Do you want to do that? You know, that, that's, so I'm turning you around into, I'm turning you into a question for you. I mean, I, mean I, I actually think it's like, can the world wait that long is, is then um, part of the, the question. Um, five years is, is half of what we need to cut emissions at least in half. Um, so are there other ways of, uh, sorry, I'm just going to totally ask a question back here. Um, are there <laughs> other ways of getting the attention of, of policy leaders? Up. That is such a great question. Look, oh, man, that is, that is a great question. I need to think about that. I don't know. I think there has to be. There has to be. But, but you know, I, I've, I've tried the talking and unless they trust you, they don't listen. So we'll have to accelerate the process of trust. Maybe there's someone in the in the group listening who, who knows about how to how to build trust in three months rather than five years? Um, that, that's well, actually. Mm. Sorry, Mark. But that, that's the key. That's all I was going to say. Well, I, I think now I'm just going to ask you like a very concrete question on the back of that, which is so I, I'm actually hoping to convene a bunch of these um, universal owners, some of the largest pension funds in the world, right yeah. before COP26, uh, yeah. with the hope that they will kind of you know, have brains full of all these systemic risks, everything from soil health to biodiversity to uh, pandemic risk and uh, antimicrobial resistance and climate change. Um, and then I'm, I'm hoping that they'll go to COP and engage with policymakers. What, what would you tell that group of people? Wow, to have their messages distilled into, into, into forms that are accessible, in a, into a form like this. I mean, I've listened to you for half an hour and convinced. I mean, it's, it, just, it sounds plausible and there was, there was lots of substance and, and the, the rationale was there. And I was thinking, oh, okay, I need to read a bit more about this. I need to have that distilled into something I can keep in my head. The same, the same goes with antimicrobial resistance and pandemics and diseases. I had the opportunity, for example, about six months ago to run a workshop on risk management for a bunch of senior civil servants. And we used a pandemic as an example, this is back in November, December. And, and yet none of what we proposed as protocols for dealing with this were translated into the government's actions when it actually came about three months later. None of it. And, and so, you uh. know, I don't know. Damn it. <laughs> yeah, damn it. So, I mean, how can it, it this seems like the nut that needs to be cracked mm. here. Mm. Um, you know, how, how do we how do we make best use of the next uh, 11 months so that we are um, mm. hitting top 20? I mean, this is an enormous, enormous opportunity and the timing coming from a global lesson in what happens if you ignore systemic risks, which is what I view this year of 2020. Um, mm. how, how do we use this kind of historic opportunity with, um, you know, a, a government that uh, does actually seem to want to do something um, and that might be able to talk to some of the more conservative governments around the world because uh, they aren't, you know, on the left side of the political spectrum, but nonetheless do seem to want to do something about climate change. You know, how, how do we how do we make best use of the next 11 months as academics to, to make COP26 a, a ripping success? That is such a great question for a workshop, isn't it? I can't I think. Don't think we're going to answer that now. But um, it is a fantastic topic for a workshop. If you if you run it, I'll come. <laughs> well, I was going to say the same to you. But yeah, sure, let's do it. <laughs> you you you've got the center for existential risk. Come on, <laughs> we're just a center for uh, environmental policy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think I see a, a joint workshop uh, I coming. Yeah, yep, yep. I, I think that's the way to go. Done. That's a deal. Great. So, Octavia, you've, you've, probably, you've, you've stimulated something. I'm not sure what it is yet, but... <laughs> find out. We have um, one more chat, uh, sorry, question in the chat, and then um, from Jeffrey. Um, I think this is directed to you, Ellen, but I think whoever would like to answer can. Um, 
Given the real existential risks we and investors face, are fund managers expecting to be on top of the pile after we collapse, or do they not see a significant risk of material collapse? Okay, that is, that's a really good question too. So uh, I would say there are two things happening. One is that people think that the music will keep playing um, as long as they're in the game. And we actually have a large group. And, and sorry, this is this is just my personal view having observed the system. So I could be totally wrong. But you know, we have a lot of people who are making 2050 commitments, for example, who are going to hit retirement long before them then and won't have to carry it out. Um, and in the meantime, the music will keep playing such that they get a you know nice retirement and, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, but also, you know, as I said before, they don't want to do worse than their colleagues in the meantime. They don't want to take that kind of career risk. Um, I think there is a subtle assumption that people will be able to time things and get out in time, but um, the evidence on that is poor. People are terrible at timing the market um, in general. Like you have to be just really lucky. Just look at what happened with the pandemic. You know, even with the kind of whispers um, that we started to hear, um, in, in January, you know, we, we kind of had warnings that this could be a pandemic and yet, you know, very few people uh, kind of purposely made money off of this. Um, so, so I, and I, I also think that they are totally mis underestimating, let's say, that they're, uh, they're underestimating the, the risk of material slash social collapse and those two things reinforce each other as well. So it can get much darker than, than people imagine. Sorry to leave it on that note. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much um, for both of your talks. They were very fascinating and the conversation. Um, we'll make sure that Cuspy will organise a workshop on how to build trust. Because <laughs> um, it's a fantastic idea, actually. Um, oh, is it? do we have time for one more question? Is that okay? Um, um, how do we address the governments of oil-rich nations, government-owned fossil fuel companies, in terms of addressing the existential risks of climate change versus short-term returns? Wow, these are such great questions. Um, so, I mean, I, I can take a stab at it, Mark, if you are Yeah, in no, your... no, I'm, I'm out of my depth here, yeah. I mean, I don't think anyone really knows how to deal with this, but um, I have two answers. Um, one is that we just need to decrease demand because that actually decreases the power of uh, you know, countries like Saudi Arabia or Russia or my home country of Canada, sorry, um, that are quite reliant on fossil fuels. Um, uh, so that's that's one answer. The other answer, though, and this is based on a really interesting uh, paper in um, put out by Cambridge Academics, um, actually, about the macroeconomic uh, risks associated with climate change. You end up with uh, a likelihood of um, a kind of price war um, it, we actually actually saw a bit earlier this year um, between Russia and Saudi Arabia, which is what happens when people start to think, oh no, like I want my oil to be the last that gets burned. Like once people start to realize that not all, all of the oil will end up being burned, it starts to be, okay, how do we make sure that ours is, is the stuff that, we, that gets sold, um, that we, we get um, revenue from? And then oil becomes so cheap that actually you don't cut uh, the, the use of it in the same way as you would. Um, so electric vehicles are slated to hit cost parity um, with like sticker price cost parity within a very short number of years. That won't happen if we get a price war that keeps the price of oil low because that's part of the uh, kind of um, the, the ongoing cost for, uh, for, for a vehicle and you're less likely to see things like massive um, uh, uh, charging stations and the other kind of infrastructure that you need to, to get away from, from oil and transport is the the big user of oil. Um, so, so I actually think you need a um, fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. That's something that policymakers, I'm really hoping will become a popular um, item of discussion by the time COP26 rolls around. Actually, I have two asks for, for government in that time. So if, if anyone can tell me how to make these two uh, uh, asks popular in the minds of uh, policymakers by then, that'd be great. So. Uh, fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, which has been a lot of people are working on this, but it basically means that you kind of agree which of your oil you'll burn. So it's actually good because you end up with more secure pricing as well and certainty um, in the fossil fuel markets, which they actually prefer um, as well. I mean, I'm sure they won't like the idea of curtailing production, but still. Um, and then the other one is is um, bringing forward some of these deadline. So net zero by 2050 is old news. What we need is 2025 20, and 2030 targets that are ambitious in line with the with the science. So uh, I, I hope those two things make it onto the agenda. 
COP26. Mm. And yes, and you have to make them popular in the minds of voters. Exactly. Mm. Well, thank you so much for both of your talks. It's, it's interesting. Me, I think I'm. I know that the IPCC was recommending the 2030 target, but the 2025 target. Yeah, should really should be the one, shouldn't it? Especially when um, the countries that have produced the most sort of carbon emissions and exploited the environment the most aren't facing any of the consequences currently. So <laughs> I agree. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I just want to say thank you to you and Mark for both giving amazing talks and conversation. And thank you to the audience for asking really insightful and interesting questions. Um, thanks so much. Um, and I think now um, what's going to happen is we'll have, yes, uh, on Monday, we had some students submit horizon scanning sort of um, reports. So what are the biggest sort of risks that will, that were, uh, or sorry, what are the biggest risks we'll face in the next coming decade? And it was a competition. And I think Lisa um, has the results of the competition and feedback from the judges that would like to go through now. And then after that, there'll be like a career fair. Um, so we have like people from the Cuspy Journal and people um, with government sort of internship opportunities coming to speak. Yeah, thank you so much. Right. Thanks. Bye. And I'll Bye. follow up. Thank you so much. I'll yes, up please. <laughs> please do. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much. Great questions too. Yes, thanks, Octavia, for, for introducing the uh, horizon scanning competition again. Oh, um, some people might have been there and might have heard the talks. We had four really good contributions from the students. I'm not sure if all of them are there. I don't think so. So um, rather than announcing, actually, it, it's been very close. So all four had very, um, very similar points. They have been um, rated by our journal editor, Emma and a horizon scanning expert um, from the Institute of Manufacturing. Um, and actually we had two people with exactly the same point. So all four of them will get one of the prizes that we announced, um, but we had one contribution that was really standing out. And what I'll do, I'll just um, read out what the judges have um, sent me back. Um, and they said, all written submissions were excellent examples of horizon scanning reports covering a range of diverse and interesting topics. Um, and that was really true. Um, these were to a professional standard from technical analysis to policy implications. The judges were particularly impressed by the presentation from Alec Christie um, on blast from the past, pandemics from permafrost, um, because it neatly combined scanning trends in pathogen uh, emergence, geopolitics, and global warning. Although technically not the most complex, this presentation stood out as an excellent example on how science can be communicated to non-technical audience, which is crucial for policy and public awareness. So, Alec, I think you're here. Congratulations. And um, congratulations also to um, the other three participants. We'll be following up and send you your vouchers and detailed feedback on which categories you scored very high and which ones you could improve later. Um, and I think we're still waiting for a couple of the careers speakers to arrive. So I suggest we do a maybe 10 minute tea break and then come back. So should we, should we say um, if everyone is interested in careers, they come back at six o'clock? Yeah, that sounds very good. Okay, amazing. Hi, Ian. Hello, I just like panic there thinking I hadn't actually registered. Ah, so no, it's all good. We just said we'd do a quick break because we've had one and a half hours already. Um, <laughs> so we'll be back uh, in at six. Cool, all right. When are we doing the bit with that I'm involved in? Six, uh, yeah, that, that would start at six. That would start oh, okay, at cool, all right.
Hi. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, Octavia. Hi. How are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you doing? Really well. Um, the reason why everyone's screens are like blacked out is um, we've just had like an hour and a half of talk. So um, we're just having like a five minute break. We'll start at six. Sounds like a plan. Great. I think it's six o'clock now. Um, so let's um, start the session again. Um, so today um, we're really lucky to have four people presenting careers opportunities. Um, we've got, let me make sure I get the, the order right. So we have Daniela Rodriguez Rincon and um, she's a senior analyst at RAND Europe, working in the area of innovation, health and science, where she focuses on health and research policy with a strong interest in infectious disease policy. Um, we also have, so I'm just making sure the order's right, uh, Ian Manning, yes. Yeah. So um, in 2016, Ian launched the Policy Challenges Programme um, in, to encourage collaboration on policy related questions between Cambridge County Council officers, officers and the best researchers in Cusby. Um, we also have, let me check, Liz. Um, so um, Liz is um, promoting some opportunities from the Government Office for Science um, where they offer graduate level positions and um, I don't want to say everything, <laughs> I'll, I'll let you speak later. Um, uh, and then finally, we have Emma, Emma Brown, and Emma Brown is from 
be Cambridge. Oh, sorry, Emma is just in the waiting room. <laughs> Emma is connecting to audio. Hi. Hi, Emma. Oh, you're on mute. Um, but yes, and we also have Emma, who's from the Cambridge Journal of Science and Policy. Um, and sort of we'll talk about the opportunities that that has as well. Um, so yeah, that's, that's basically it. Um, I think it was, if Danielle, would you like to like speak first? Yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Danielle Rodriguez, and I'm a senior analyst at RAND Europe. Uh, which is a not-for-profit research institute um, whose mission is to help improve policy and decision making through research and analysis. So a lot of you may have heard of RAND Corporation, even if you haven't heard of RAND Europe. Um, so RAND Europe is the smaller cousin of RAND Corporation. Uh, we're very linked to them. Uh, we have offices in Cambridge and in Brussels. Uh, the Cambridge office has about 100 um, employees, whereas the Brussels office is actually quite smaller. Uh, they oversee our European portfolio and there are about eight people there at the moment. So at RAND Europe, we have uh, three main teams at the moment. So we have defense, security, and infrastructure. Uh, we have home affairs and social policy. And then we have um, innovation, health, and science, which is the team that I currently belong to. Um, so we do a broad, range of research, um, as you can imagine, based on our research groups. So in defense, security, and infrastructure, I think the name speaks for itself. Um, in home affairs and social policy, that one may be a bit uh, trickier to do to understand what they do, but they do a lot of randomized control trials, um, mostly focused on areas such as uh, gender inequality or immigration, um, education, quite a big group on, on education as well. And then there's innovation, health, and science, um, in which we do everything from emerging technology to science of science, basically how to improve the research system and uh, health and well-being as well. So we, I'm gonna talk a bit about what I know best, which is health and research policy, because um, that is the area that I sit under and it's hard for me to talk about what other groups do as well. Um, so in health and research policy, we do a broad range of projects. Uh, most of what we do is actually contract work, but we also, because we're a not-for-profit research institute, we are also eligible for grants. Um, so we do a lot of work for the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control, uh, which currently is um, commissioning quite a bit of, of work based on COVID, as you can imagine. Uh, we also do a bit of private work for pharma, um, but as long as this has implications for policy. We don't do like most consultancies that just uh, seek to improve um, their profits, but rather how, for example, um, what outcomes should actually be considered for a new treatment uh, rather than the economic aspect of this. Um, we also do work for like Cancer Research UK, the MRC. Um, so all the research institutes that you may have heard of, uh, we've possibly done some work with them, basically evaluating their programs just to see if, uh, for example, um, the MRC is actually getting benefit from funding PhD students um, or early uh, academic researchers. So now the part that I think is more interesting for you, the opportunities that we offer at RAND. Um, so we have a broad range of um, opportunities available specifically for early career researchers. We do trainee positions. Uh, these are very Brussels specific. Uh, so these are a fixed term, I think it's about nine months contract in which uh, people will have a very EU focus. So they'll work a lot with the European Commission, uh, oversee the frameworks that we do with them. Um, and I mean, technically it should be based in the Brussels office, but currently you can be based anywhere in the world um, because we're working remotely as I think most of you are as well. Uh, we also have internships at the Cambridge office, but these are quite rare. Um, and if you would be interested in an internship, then you would have to get in contact either with HR or with me and I will get you in contact with HR. Uh, but as I said, these aren't very frequent, um, frequently available. And yeah, so there's also the research assistant position. We actually are recruiting quite a bit at the moment for research assistant positions, um, which most, uh, most RAs tend to have a master's degree. Uh, if you have a PhD, then you'll most likely be recruited into an analyst position, which is more of a research focus rather than research admin position. Um, but as I said, we do have quite a bit of opportunities available at the moment. If you check our website, um, it should be there. 
And if you have any other questions regarding that, do get in contact with me and I'll put you in contact with the right people. So I think that's my five minute intro on what we offer at RAND and then I'll take all your questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, um, Ian? Oh, cool. thank you very much, and, and thank you for having me. I'm just going to try and share my screen. Is that going to work? Uh, let's have a look. Uh, excellent. Right. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm uh, I'm sort of the odd one out in that I'm not an academic. Or I suppose it was about 15 years ago or 20 years ago now. Um, but uh, I'm a, an elected politician on um, Cambridgeshire County Council, which is the county, and I've got this uh, absolute mouthful of a title, which is only my fault because I gave myself it, um, of member champion for evidence informed uh, evidence informed policy. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, member is the the phrase that councillors are referred to internally within the bureaucracy of the council because we are members of the council, which is why. And a member champion is just a generic. Basically, I I have a sort of I don't have a direct portfolio, but I do have a, a specific area that I'm responsible for. Um, so I just wanted to, <laughs> um, there's a couple of slides here about just how convoluted um, local government is in, in um, Cambridgeshire. And partly I want, although this slide is going to probably mean absolutely nothing to many people if you're not familiar with it, the point here is it's a brilliant place to really understand how complex local government and governance arrangements can take place because we are literally one of the most complicated in the country. We've got effectively five or six layers, depending on how you look at it. Um, and that sort of just vaguely illustrates them there. Um, and then within that, if I then stick on the political colours, you've got a mix of, you know, I mean, there's a lot of blue there. Um, so blue is Conservative, red is Labour, uh, yellow is Liberal Democrat. The grey is just, um, there's no control in those, in those senses. But it just gives you a lot of experience of kind of navigating both the complex local government landscape, but also a political landscape. Um, so that's the only reason I sort of mentioned that. Um, the uh, thing I was going to take you through was a little bit about what the challenges are. So this diagram, which I can't take any credit for, but is really good. It uh, was done by a, an intern we had in um, Kasia Visigi. Um, and this is just sort of how we do what the policy challenges are and what we do. So we start um, at, at this point, probably don't have an animated version. I'm using the uh, rather primitive method of dragging my cursor around the screen. So I hope it, I hope it's large enough that people can see. Um, so we start with getting up a list of what we call the policy challenges and I'll give some examples of them later but basically these are created by a combination of uh, count senior council officers and councillors um, and we create a short list um, we narrow that down by sort of chucking out ones where based on experience we think the data wouldn't be there in the council or you'd have to know too much in a short time scale about how local government works to be able to tackle it effectively um, because these are aiming at six months these challenges um, we have uh, a launch event which we started two years ago um, where we kind of get in a college, we have sort of nibbles and wine and stuff and we have this like a pitch event, a bit like sort of like Dragon's Den I suppose, a little bit like that, um, where we, the, the, the idea behind this is it's supposed to be the whole relationship is 50-50, we're not just giving you a list of things we want you to do, we're giving you a long list of topic areas we're interested in and getting some new thinking on and we're asking you to tell us which one of those you're most interested in. Um, and then there's, we, we, we form the teams based upon um, the what people apply for and what they say they're interested in. And we try and you know, the idea is to try and give everyone their first choice. It doesn't always work out like that. Um, and specifically, what we're interested in a lot of the time is kind of allocating people to things that aren't necessarily their specialism, because that's important to get new thinking. You know, you don't necessarily want... Um, uh, necessarily an entire team tackling an education question all having a background in education you want some of them having backgrounds in other things that, that give you new thinking um the um there are then monthly meetings which are run um between depending on depending on the the particular challenge they're run with between council officers um the team members of the team um and what stakeholders by which it really means sort of external parties um, and, and essentially the councillors who, who who posed the original question um, and what that's really about is to um, kind of, oops, sorry, it's a typical, sorry, there's a, I'm going on the radio tomorrow morning, that's a call about that. Um, so 
the 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 point about this is that there's a process here whereby in these meetings the the initial questions which are quite high level are kind of refined between the, what the team's interested in between what the councillors are interested in um and where the and where any officers are interested in and where the thinking is going and um potentially in some cases we hold extra events um so we had uh last year we had our first two um challenges that involved climate change research um and uh because of the how can i put this um because of our knowledge that some members of the council maybe had some doubts about some of the science or had more questions about it we we put on a couple of extra seminars so people could actually ask about the research in advance of the committee um and then eventually the the, the key stage is the report goes to a council committee and that's this is the really key thing about the program you that you know unless you really really mess up which has not really happened so far um apart from in a couple of cases which wasn't the team's fault you're you're you you have a sort of target of getting a report to a committee that makes some recommendations and on the county council the committee set the policy it's not like national government where you've got a sort of an amorphous body and a minister that can say no you have an entire cross-party committee that sets policy uh, and you make a bunch of recommendations the committee hopefully says you're all brilliant and votes it all through um, and you have uh, at the end of the year we have a wrap-up event again it's the usual thing covid it's kind of uh, changed a bit this year but the, um, the key thing here is that it's, it's supposed to be the 50 50 relationship we're getting something out of it because we're getting a bunch of brilliant people doing some research that's giving us interesting new ideas you're getting something out of it because you will have something you can stick on a cv um you can stick in a job application um, and we have several people who brought it up and have been successful in in applications to, to external bodies off the back of it um that gives you a sort of a, a rough idea of what the challenges were this year that some of the questions were changed a bit um for this year there would have been more but covid again we had officers that were joining the council going to do and there's a really so there's a really exciting piece of research about a thing called health in all policies which is where you put public health into all your decisions um that officer was seconded before they actually started their job because of covid so we had you would you know the usual challenges and you know potentially last year the big piece of research that got on so got on the front page of the um University of Cambridge um, uh, website um, was the climate change research. There was also an excellent piece on, I think, called the Healthy Fenland Fund. Um, but I suppose climate change is a bit sexier at the moment, isn't it? But um, but the, the point is, this, this you know, if you do if you do this and you do well, you have every chance to get something out of it that's going to help both give you an interesting experience to how local government and governance works, interact directly with both politicians and senior decision makers and give you something you can use in your future career um, and, 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 uh, and, and successes. So there you go. Thanks a lot. Um, and then I think Liz. Thanks, Octavia. Um, yeah, so I'm going to give a bit of an overview for um, four different ways that you can get into the government office for science. Um, and I just wanted to say before I started that the policy challenges that Ian have just talked about are a fantastic um, addition to your CV. Having been on um, the interview panel for some of these roles, I can guarantee that that is the sort of experience and demonstrated interest that is really, really helpful in getting into, um, I guess, science, science policy roles uh, directly. So I uh, back up what he said there. Um, so. Uh, just a bit of an overview of the Government Office for Science uh, first. You've probably seen um, the head of the Government Office for Science, uh, Sir Patrick Valance, on the news quite a lot recently for his involvement with the COVID response. Uh, that's only one aspect of what the Government Office for Science does. So we have a really um, or a very flexible team when it comes to emergency. So they respond uh, to everything from um, COVID to flooding. Uh, so uh, that, that team is very adaptable and that's a really key facet of what we do. But we also do um, quite a lot of work uh, in a couple of different areas as well. So projects are one of the things that we do and we particularly pick up uh, cross-departmental sort of projects with um, a science focus. So whether that's on climate, whether that's on uh, transport, things that really uh, are cross-cutting and really futures focused in that way. Um, and they, they often involve a lot of collaboration with academics, with policymakers to try and develop recommendations about how the government should be looking um, at these policy areas related to science. Uh, we also uh, support a number of different bodies, um, including the science and engineering profession across government. So trying to raise the status of scientists that are already working within government. 
um, as well as uh, independent bodies. So we also support the Prime Minister's Council for Science and Technology, which is made up of a lot of independent experts that feed advice directly into the Prime Minister. So those are just a couple of the things um, that, that we work on and that people, um, that you, you could work on if you came into the department through any of these um, uh, pathways, I guess, that I'm about to go through. So. Um, there's four that I really want to highlight. So uh, the first is um, for existing PhD students uh, that are funded by UKRI. So the Research Council funding um, opens up the opportunity for you to do a UKRI policy internship placement. Uh, these are three month placements. Um, they will add that three months onto the end of your PhD. So you just paid through your stipend um, as per usual, but you can reimburse the travel costs when travel happens again. Um, and these are really fantastic opportunities. I know actually quite a lot of people who have done these internships and either um, definitely gone into government off the back of them. Um, I've, I've seen them re pop back up in my department uh, over the years, and then some have gone completely into academia. So <laughs> it's a real, um, it's a really good way to get that experience. Uh, the government office for science also offers graduate level role so every year we have um a they call them internships but they are full one year paid roles um so this graduate internship program where um you're embedded in one of the teams so you get a bit of flexibility to try and match you to an area of interest within the department um and those um those positions uh, last for a year and they're a really good springboard for getting other roles within government because once basically once you're on the inside um, it's much easier to get other roles because some of the roles within government are advertised externally. So that will probably come up about June next year to start in October. Um, and that's one, one of the ways, particularly for recent graduates, it's a really good way to get into um, the civil service uh, working on science policy. Uh, a couple of the other options that are available to you are the fast stream. So a lot of people have heard of the civil service fast stream, but not everyone knows about the science and engineering track within that. So the science and engineering fast stream is specifically looking for people with science qualifications um, and they will place you in um, across government. It's a two or three, I think it's a three year program. Um, and you, you enter uh, at a, uh, it's around 28K salary, but it's very highly regarded within government and there's really quick opportunities for advancement. Um, these people are basically identified as future leaders within um, the civil service. So they're going to try and place you in different departments that do science policy, broadly speaking. Um, then the last uh, way I wanted to highlight is just applying for jobs. So civil service uh, has quite a lot of jobs that are advertised externally, though some are only advertised internally. It really depends on the level um, and the year, the season. Uh, it goes through phases, I think, uh, and cycles. So at the moment, it looks like it's a really good time to enter government. I know my department particularly has expanded in the last um, in the last year from about 70 people to about 100, over 100, and they're still growing. So it's a really good time if you're looking to apply for jobs within the Government Office for Science. Um, I'd recommend uh, graduates kind of look, they, there's a couple of different levels, but the levels I'd recommend for recent graduates are more HEO, SEO, Level. So that's higher executive officer and senior executive officer, depending on your experience. Um, and I think um, there, there's a lot of different opportunities there and it, it's really fast paced. So you'll probably move around within one or two years uh, into, into new roles, into new departments, into new uh, projects. So it's, um, it's fairly dynamic. Um, I'll share some links with those, but uh, happy to uh, answer any questions at the end. Thank you. And finally, we have Emma. Thanks so much. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Oh, can I? Can you permit me, Octavia? Sure. Um, I think we can make you a co-host. Yes, I think it's done. Sure, perfect. OK. Okay, you can see this, yeah? Okay, um, so I'm gonna talk a bit about CUSP's journal, um, which is the Cambridge Journal of Science and Policy. We launched last year um, and our first uh, issue actually was on sustainability. So um, we were trying to link in with this forum, but 
COVID didn't quite uh, match up the timings uh, so well, but uh, do take a look at that if you're interested in articles on sustainability on the CUSP website. We now have two issues and we're heading into our second volume. So we're doing a call for papers at the moment. So you can um, get involved with us and become a published author if you um, if you want to and if you make it through the peer review process. So what are we? Um, we are an open access, triple blind peer reviewed journal. Um, submitted articles and accepted articles will go on Apollo, which is the university's repository for research output, um, and you'll be given a DOI. So we are a, a proper journal um, and uh, we really pride ourselves on uh, sort of encouraging the science policy interface and publishing articles, particularly from early career researchers, as well as late career researchers, but we work very closely with authors, particularly those that are early career, to maximise the potential of your of your articles and really get the most out of your work. Um, last year, we had a lot of submissions from students who were studying policy MPhils or who were scientists um, studying MRes or PhD uh, subjects and. Um, a lot of people turned their essays and some of their coursework and adapted that for the for the purposes of the journal. So don't be afraid to do that. That's a great way to disseminate your work further um, than just writing it for your course. Why not? If it's a novel idea, why not uh, get it out into the wider community? Um, the types of articles that we publish, we mainly publish two types of articles, communications, um, which should be similar to a policy brief, um, something similar to like a post note, if any of you are familiar with these that are written by the Parliamentary Office for Science and Technology. Um, they are, tend to be quite data driven, uh, around one or 2000 words. So that's the communications. We also um, publish perspectives. These are should be around a thousand words, no more, and they're much more opinionated. So they're less data driven, sort of your opinion on a particular policy debate. Um, yeah, it'd be really great to hear from you. So for volume two first issue, the deadline is 29th of January 2021. So get writing over Christmas and submit to us and uh, hopefully get published. Um, yeah, I think that's about all I have to say for now. Thanks a lot for everyone presenting these amazing opportunities. I think because there's there's about um, 15 of us here, um, excluding the speakers, um, I wanted to ask um, a question. So basically we could go either one of two ways now. We could either have like um, people asking questions sort of in this room, like in, uh, or we could create like breakout rooms for each of the people and then we can have like more individual conversations. And I was wondering if we should do a poll. <laughs> so if um, people want to vote. Oh, it looks. Well, no is definitely, oh, we've got some yeses. <laughs> Well, I think seven, seven out of 12 means um, we have a majority. So I think we're gonna not go into breakout room. Okay, um, amazing. So does anyone have any like questions they want to ask to any individuals? Um, I have a question um, for Ian. I was just wondering what like, let like I'm, I'm very, I'm only in my, third, like I'm a finalist this year. So I understand a lot of these opportunities aren't aimed for people like me who haven't graduated yet. Um, so what level, like how old are the people that apply for the policy challenges? Um, you um, there's a mix actually. We, we've, we've had people who are readers before in some of the policy challenges. So obviously you're in there, okay. you know, like, I mean, it's an interesting question that comes up, it's come up a few times um, hmm. about how, um, 
where, where the cutoff is. And there was one year where we sort of used a cutoff because there were so many applications and we can only do a, that year, we can only do a limited amount of challenges where we kind of had to make a decision that I wasn't 100% comfortable with, that we just had to pick people who were PhD and above. Um, that's not a rule though. Um, and mm. this year we were originally planning to do a lot more challenges than four. Um, and there would have been people in those challenges who I'm not sure whether I'm struggling to remember if anyone who didn't graduate hadn't graduated yet, but there were certainly undergraduates. Um, okay. Sorry, I mean some. Yeah, so there, there was a thing about master's students, but yeah, I, as long as your team is composed of a bunch of people who are uh, good, and as long as people are committed, there's not really any reason why we shouldn't be saying, mm. you know, we should be cutting people out because they've not got a certain level. Um, does anyone have any questions? Can I ask Liz a question? Oh, yeah. um, hey Liz. Um, the internships that last for one year at the Government Office of Science, when do they get released for application? Um, so it's normally uh, around June for starting around October. This year, um, I think I, I blinked and I missed them. I think they were only open for a really short amount of time. Um, uh, so they, they have already been advertised for this year for starting um, starting shortly. Um, but yeah, normally it'll come up around June. The best way to kind of um, keep an eye on that is to follow the Foresight blog, mm -hmm. which is I, I've posted in the chat because they will generally post, they'll post other things as well, but that's one of the ways you can normally see um, uh, new internships and uh, Twitter as well. They normally will promote them on there, but uh, th there's no direct uh, mailing list, sorry. Perfect, thank you. We have a question to Liz from Grace. Oh, wonderful. Oh, fantastic question, Grace. Um, I would have to have a look into that regarding whether your PhD is specifically relevant, but I guess the um, a really key thing to point out is that you could also join the non-science and engineering fast stream if that was of interest to you, um, which is open to every discipline. And they are looking for people with those higher degrees um, in those sorts of streams as well. But I think I, I, I would probably, if I were you, I'd probably apply to the science and engineering fast stream in any case. Um, I might be able to find out for you if that's helpful, but. It is, it is so relevant to how government particularly needs to perceive um, science policy that I think it'd be, it'd be worth, um, worth applying. I'll see if I can find more information for you. <laughs> see if anyone's like thinking of some questions. <laughs> I don't know if it's just worth saying that the, the, the policy challenges we take people from all sorts of it's not just science backgrounds it's social sciences and economics ec economics can't speak properly um you know what I'm trying to say uh so I mean the best thing is to get a you know, to get a, the idea is to get a mix in the team is to mm. give a spread of kind of ideas do you um apply as a team then do you or with an oh no sorry ideas. i didn't explain that did i uh, no the, no the, you apply as an individual and you put a preference for the team and then we put right. you in the teams based on the preferences so okay um, we have a question to daniela from maddie um what does an average day look like slash what is the project you've worked on recently oh you two know each other <laughs> sorry <laughs> Yeah, so that, that's a very interesting question that we actually, in every recruitment process, someone will always ask what a day looks like in our life. Um, and the straightforward answer is every day will be very different um, because you can have a day in which you're expecting to focus on saying reading some literature and all of a sudden you will have eight different client meetings and there goes your day. Um, so it, it's very different, but overall we do, alternate between doing research, uh, engaging with clients. Also, we do quite a bit of proposal work. Um, so different grades will do different things, both in a, pro in a project and in a proposal. Uh, but for example, my day today, I think it's the easiest way of explaining it. My day today consisted of uh, one client meeting. Then I did 
part of a literature review for a project that we're doing with the European Commission. Um, we also talked about our strategy within the EU because even though I'm based in the, in the Cambridge office, I'm actually um, quite related to our EU portfolio. Uh, we had a team meeting, we did a brainstorming. So it, it very much depends, uh, but you will be, if you are an analyst, you're expected to spend 80% of your time working on projects. And this involves uh, from thinking of the methodology to writing up a public policy re ready report um, if you're a research assistant, you'll have more corporate tasks, so you'll help more with the organization overall, uh, but you'll also have 60% of your time spent on project work. Um, and the higher you go, actually, the less project work you do and the more um, work you're supposed to bring in and client engagement. So I hope that answers your question, <laughs> but it's difficult to explain a day in the life. Sorry, I was muted. Um, can that question be opened up to everyone? Um, everyone else? What's like a day in their life? So I see there's another question for me. Oh, there's also another. Um, so how easy is it to move between the different RAND branches? Um, so a, a clarification question to the CUSP committee. What do you mean different RAND branches? Is it different teams within RAND Europe? Is it different offices within RAND Europe? Is it different branches as in RAND Corporation, RAND Europe, RAND Australia? I, I was thinking about the different offices within, within Europe, actually. Uh, so it's actually, um, I don't know the full answer to that, uh, but I think it's quite easy. So if you start in the Brussels office and you realize that your work actually links you more to the UK, there's no reason that you can't um, ask for a transfer. We are the same organization. So RAND Europe is one organization just with two different offices. Um, and the same is true if you start in Cambridge and then you decide that your work wants to take you to Brussels, even though that's less likely because it's a much smaller um, office. But I don't know of anyone in particular who's done it recently, so I don't know how easy it is, but I don't expect it to be difficult, to be honest. Thank you. Uh, day in the life question is kind of an interesting one, isn't it? Um, so I, for people, I don't know how many people are aware, but um, unless you're an MP, a mayor or a, and that's a, well, even this is complicated because we basically we like to make local government as convoluted as possible in the UK so no one can understand it um, it's as far as I can tell um, but the thing I was going to say is that the councillors the people at my level are not paid a full salary um, so I get 10 grand a year to be a county councillor that's like 10,000 constituents ish um, city councillors get three and a half thousand those are those are relatively low numbers but they don't get much higher um, so the point is you have to have your own some other source of income um, so well, was basically because he's saying what's the day like well my day was getting up and doing IT most of the day because that's my day job and then doing bits of council work in breaks or um, doing this in the evening and it's it's actually a, a key thing because it's I was going to say it's kind of great to be on a panel where I'm uh, as a white middle-aged bloke I'm in the minority um, but there's no wonder why you've got a problem with diversity in politics because you've got to have an independent income to be able to to do council level stuff and even and to be an MP is even harder yeah you okay you've got a salary when you get there but you know it's um it's a, but then it's a, I, i've always wanted to do a policy challenge on how you how you crack that circle of do you pay people more and then people do it for the wage and you get a certain sort of person doing it or do you not pay people and then you have you have the problem i've already described i'm not sure there is an answer but <laughs> someone could come up with one you need to probably solve quite a lot of societal problems as well i'm watching it now i'm going to shut up <laughs> Right. <clears throat> if there are no more final questions or anyone from anyone, no? Um, great, I think it's been, it's been three hours now. <laughs> um, and I think, I think we should wrap up now then, I guess. Thank you so much, um, Emma, Daniela, Liz, Ian. Thank you so much for all coming and giving your time and Thank you again to the audience for answering, like, ask, sorry, asking really interesting questions. Um, so yeah, thanks a lot. And That's also okay. thank you to um, Lisa, who's CUSPI committee um, for organising, she's like the lead um, organising the whole forum. So yeah, round of applause, Lisa. <laughs>
Thanks, Octavia. Thank you for moderating today. That was, that was really good. And thanks for Amazing. the speakers. Um, it, was, it was great to have you here. It was very interesting. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Oh, done. Very well done. Good. Oh, it's still on YouTube. It's still recording. <laughs>